Hey, I'm Jake Lizio, and in this video, we're gonna learn pretty much everything you want to know about chord inversions and slash chord notation. This is a topic that's often taught early on in music theory classes, but I don't find it very helpful until you've got a good grasp of writing diatonic chord progressions in major and minor. So if you're not familiar with those concepts, check the video description below where I've linked to two videos that describe that. Having a good grasp of inverted chords is really gonna free you up to write way more interesting, melodic, and moving chord progressions. At the end of this video, we're gonna examine a few different examples of where we've heard these kind of things used to really great effect. But for the first half of the lesson, we really need to focus on what are inverted chords how do we read them and understand them, and how can we write them as well? To get started, I'm just going to pick the key of A major, and we're just going to build an A major triad or an A major chord. That's just the first note of the A major scale, the third note, and the fifth note. So that would be the notes A, C sharp, and E. And if I play those three notes at the same time, I will get an A major chord, as long as A is on the bass, as long as A is the lowest note that's ringing out. So I can play those notes in this order. I could play A, E, A, C sharp, and E, and we'd still call that an A major chord in its root position. I can play those notes in any order as long as A is on the bass. So here's another version of an A major chord. Here's another version of an A major chord. Here's another version of an A major chord. Those are all A chords because they contain the notes A, C sharp, and E, and A is on the bass. Now, a chord in first inversion means that instead of our root being our bass note, our third is now our bass note. So our third was C sharp, and if I make that the lowest note of an A chord like this, I have an A chord in first inversion. And once again, I can rearrange the order of these notes to get different kinds of A in its first inversion. But that's all that a first inverted chord is. It means the third is now played on the bass. And to notate this, there's a traditional way to notate a chord in first inversion. We'd write an A, and then we would follow it up with the numbers six and and three. What that's telling us is it's telling us the distances between our notes now. If we look at my A chord now, we'll see that C sharp is my new bass note. And the distance from that bass note to the next note is a minor third. That's what the three represents. The distance from my bass note to the next note after that is a minor sixth. That's what the six represents. So when you see six three, it's really just describing the intervals there, but you just want to memorize that six three means a chord in its first inversion. That means the third is now being played on the bass. Now, I'll be honest, I really don't like that notation. It's descriptive, um, but it's kind of old and it's kind of confusing as well. To make matters worse, a lot of composers will just notate this with a giant number six instead, and people might read that and think that they're talking about a sixth chord. So I don't really prefer to use this notation, but it is important to know it because it does pop up quite a bit. What I would rather do to describe what we just saw is write the chord as A slash C sharp. Anytime you see a slash chord in music, it just means that, hey, we've replaced our bass note. A is supposed to have A on the bass, but the slash is telling us that we've replaced that bass note with a C sharp. So when I see a chord like this, I would much rather write it as A slash C sharp than A six three. Now, if we take a look at that same chord in second inversion, it just means that our fifth is now being played on the bass. So we could take a look at those same chords. We have E now, and then an A, and then a C sharp, and then another E. This would be an A in its second inversion. I would just call it A slash E. I think that's the much easier way to describe this chord. But the traditional way to notate it would be an A and six, four. And once again, that's describing the intervals here. If you look at my new bass note, which is E, you'll notice the distance between E and A is a perfect fourth. That's what the four represents. The distance between E and C sharp is a major sixth, and that's what the six represents. So really, this is all you got to memorize. The traditional way to notate this is that a chord in first inversion is called a 6-3 chord, and it has the third on the bass. A chord in its second inversion is a 6-4 chord, and it has the fifth on the bass. Now, everything we just learned applies identically to minor chords. So if I look at an A minor chord, I have an A and a C and an E. So here's an A minor in root position. I could put it into uh, its first inversion just by adding that C onto the bass. Now I'm playing an A slash, an A minor slash C, or an A minor six three. Once again, if I put E on the bass, I could just let the low open E ring out when I play this, and I'd have an A minor slash E or an A minor 6-4. So why should we care about this stuff? How is it gonna help us write better chord progressions? Well, to answer that, I just wanna demonstrate a very simple example using just three different chords. If I go from my one chord in A, which is A, to my five chord, which is E, to my six chord, which is F sharp minor, we have a simple little chord progression that just sounds nice to the ear. One, five, six. 
And let's just pay close attention to what the bass is doing during that chord progression. On the A chord, the bass plays an A. On the E chord, the bass plays an E. On F sharp minor, the uh, bass plays an F sharp. So our bass is this big jump from A down to E and then up to F sharp. A, E, F sharp, A, E, F sharp. Now that sounds fine, but we could completely recraft that bass line into something less jumpy and to something a little smoother. We could have it descend all the way down to F sharp just by introducing some inverted chords. So here's my A chord again, but instead of playing E with E on the bass, I'm gonna play E with G sharp on the bass instead. And it gives me this motion from A major to E slash G sharp. And did you hear my bass note going from A to G sharp to F sharp minor? And I think that sounds, I'm not gonna say better, but it's different. And there's gonna be instances where you would rather do something like that, where the bass is slowly falling, as opposed to this bass movement that's jumping up and down. I think for something like a love song, where you're trying to kind of create this feeling of actually falling in love, or you're doing something that has that, that descending effect, a, an inverted chord is gonna save you there from that wild, jumpy bass movement. And just for reference, this chord progression where we have our, our tonic and then we have our inverted five chord and then we go to our six chord in root position, you're going to see this everywhere. Off the top of my head, the first few chords of uh, American Pie by Don McLean is a G chord, that's the one, and then it does a D over F sharp, that's an inverted five, and then it goes to the six chord. Uh, also Freebird is starts off with a G, D F sharp, slash F sharp, and then E minor. So you're gonna see that exact movement quite a bit. And you should be able to recognize now that that movement, that popular chord progression, is created just through the clever use of a single uh, major chord in first inversion. Now let's take a look at some deeper and more interesting uses of these inverted chords in action. And I'm gonna go over three different examples by three prolific songwriters. The first example I wanna take a look at is from George Harrison's Something. I did do an entire analysis on just this song, so check out that video if you like what you're hearing here. But I really just wanna focus on this small little section of chords that happens during our happier uh, major chorus sections. Those are in the key of A major, and they tra change from the one chord, A major, to the three chords, C sharp minor. Now normally the bass movement there would move up that major third. We have A then up to C sharp minor. Instead though they play that C sharp minor in its second inversion. That means my new bass note is G sharp. And that means my bass movement is now falling down just a half step. So it's going to go from A to G sharp on the bass. The next chord is just the sixth chord, F sharp minor in root position. And then they go back to the tonic chord, A, but once again, that is flipped into second inversion. So the fifth is on the bass. Now, if you look at the bass note that we, just the bass notes of that chord progression, you'll notice they go from A to G sharp, to F sharp, to E. We've got a nice descending chord progression all the way through there that sounds really nice, even though our chords are changing all over the place. And if you compare the two side by side, here are the notes in root position, A major, A, C sharp, then F sharp, then A. Now compare that bass movement to A, G sharp, then F sharp, then E. I think it's a you know completely different effect. Like I said, I don't want to say better or worse, but I think in that instance, I would much rather hear it in that arrangement as opposed to just those big jumpy bass movements. Now for me personally, the first time I really grew to appreciate inverted chords is when I learned Dream Theater's Regression. It's the acoustic track that starts off their album Scenes from a Memory. And it's in the key of D, it starts off on a D major chord, then it plays a D slash F sharp. That's a D in first inversion. Straight into a G, which is the four chord, and then back to D, and then a D slash C sharp, which isn't a major chord in first inversion, but you could think of it as a major seventh chord that's being inverted. Then straight to the sixth chord, B minor, and then that bass note from B minor just turns into an A, so it's a B minor slash A. And once again, you could think of this as a minor seven chord that has been inverted, but I'm just gonna call it a B minor seven, or a B minor slash A. Then straight to an E slash G sharp, so an E chord in first inversion, and we can think of that as the five of our five. It's a secondary dominant chord to take us to A major. And A major will help us resolve back to D. So I think that's a really clever use of chords. You got some nice, you know, stuff in there. You got a secondary dominant. You got some nice bass movement. And if you listen to this chord progression without those bass movements, it's pretty boring. 
you know, in my opinion, those bass movements are really the only reason that chord progression works. Without it, you've just got this really simple, boring, you know, diatonic chord progression up until that surprise E major. So I think by adding in that bass movement, then you're getting a lot more interest out of that simple chord progression. D, D over F sharp, straight to the G, back to D slash C sharp, then B minor, B minor slash A, E slash G sharp, and then A sus4 to A. For our last example, I won't fault you if you don't recognize it. I had written a song a few years back called Generations, and I posted it here on the channel. It's an instrumental prog rock song, and the verse sections all consist of some really simple chords that have just been uh, enhanced through the use of slash chords, adding in new chords to the bass, and taking chord inversions, and kind of helping create a little bit more interesting uh, movement there on the bass. So the chord progression at its most basic level is just a D, and then a D slash C sharp and then a C major, and then a G major. What I ended up turning that into was a D sus2, and then a D sus2 slash C sharp, and then a C, and then a G over B. And if you look at the bass movement there, you'll notice that the bass is just descending a half step at a time, like that. And to make this chord progression more interesting, I added in even more bass movement, to, just on its own, to help that bass uh, kind of, you know, really uh, have its own role, even as a guitar player. I wanted to have a prominent bass movement. So it turned into this, the D over C sharp to C major, and then G over B. And then I finally bring in the G. After that, it just goes back to a D sus2, but it goes straight to a B minor seven, and then a B flat with a uh, added sharp 11 for some nice tritony goodness. Now, if you're curious where those chords come from, you may have recognized they're not all in the key of C, then you're going to definitely want to check out my lessons on borrowed chords. Because in my opinion, if you understand how to write a diatonic chord progression, if you understand borrowed chords, if you understand secondary dominant chords, and you understand chord inversions, you are basically prepared to write any chord progression. That to me are the four huge pillars of progression writing. And if you, you know, if you're struggling with any one of those topics right now, I highly suggest you go back over those topics and master them. Because to me, I think you're you're almost untouchable as a composer if you have a really good grasp of these four concepts. Combine them together and you can just you will be have an infinite supply of interesting, unique, uh, and recognizable chord progressions. Now before we close things out, there's a few things we gotta talk about. First, this uh, notation that we talked about earlier, the one I said I didn't like with the 6-3 and the 6-4, that's called figured bass. And you can actually go even more detail in that. There's where there's figured bass notation for 7th chords and minor 7th chords. So you can, uh, if you do like that notation and you're interested in, you know, in learning that, definitely pursue that on your own. There's plenty of information there out on the internet. But I will say that it's going to be pretty impractical to most musicians who are just guitar players. It's a much more practical, uh, you know, notation to learn if you're going to be writing out scores or if you're planning on enlisting in some college level music theory classes that's a pretty important topic to learn I also really want to encourage people to use slash chord notation. It's so easy. When I say something like A slash C sharp, it instantly tells us what it is. We don't have to count intervals or remember which one is first inversion, which one is second inversion. The only thing is, is when you use slash chords, you can sometimes uh, misname a chord. Like if I took uh, the chord A slash F sharp, well, the, the chord A slash F sharp, if I look at all those notes in order, I basically get the notes of an F sharp minor seventh chord. So should you call it an F sharp minor seven or should you call it an A slash F sharp? There's actually times where it would make more sense to call it an A slash F sharp. Like let's say I was doing an A major and then A slash G sharp and then A slash F sharp and then A slash E. It's very similar to the George Harrison thing we heard. I would rather call that an A slash F sharp because it kind of tells us what's going on. We have an A major triad that's static, it's unchanged, and then underneath that our bass note is moving once at a time. You could notate that as A major and then A slash G sharp and then call it an F sharp minor seven. But to me, it doesn't describe the music as well. So there's many times when you're dealing with slash chords where a chord can literally have two different names. It's also worth noting that if we rearrange those same notes of an F sharp minor seven, then we get the notes of an A six chord. That's an A triad with a natural sixth added. 
So, you know, we've got three different ways to call that same, that same chord, could have three potential names, and a good composer just picks the name that best describes what's going on. So I hope this video helps you out, and if it did, you're gonna have to thank my awesome Patreon supporters for making it possible. They've been supporting this channel, and in exchange, I post them some PDFs and occasional MP3s and special videos. If you'd like to join them, you can, there's links below in the description, but if you don't like to do that, you can just like, subscribe, and comment if you'd like to help me out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.